This week, you could win one of three bundles for the Silver Bayonet. Winners will be chosen from OnTabletop.com, YouTube, and the Cop of Games members. Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel for this, our Silver Bayonet themed week. Uh, today I'm joined by Phil Smith, the editorial director from Osprey Games. It's a very impressive title. I think it's the most <laughs> impressive title we've ever had. It's relatively meaningless. Oh, don't tell us that. I've built you up so much. Um, we want to go into a bit about Silver Bennett, where it's come from and where it's going to. Uh, and obviously the guys at Osprey plan these things out well, well, well in advance. So hopefully you'll get a chance to see behind the curtain with Phil this morning. Uh, but to kick things off, um, Phil, are you a gamer yourself or did you have gaming thrust upon you within the realms of Osprey? Um, a little bit of both, really. Uh, I started off, as I think a lot of people do, with a love of history as a kid and love of fantasy novels and from there warhammer and rapidly discovered uh, warhammer ancient battles mm. and that was kind of it it was all downhill from there um <laughs> and yeah it, i started osprey 16 odd years ago because it was military history and yeah, i worked yeah. on the books and uh we had field of glory in development already right. and um was the, the first war game Osprey were doing. And um, as one of two war gamers then on staff, I rapidly inherited it. The other, of course, being uh, Joe McCullough. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of where that little collaboration started. And yeah, success led to success and ended up taking over the, the war gaming list and growing it and then Osprey Games. And here we are, really. In that case, we have much to be thankful for. <laughs> because I've shelves filled with uh, Osprey games uh, to the to the hilt, and I, I keep forgetting that uh, Fog was um, was the, was the first, uh, and it's it's a heck of a first game to to sort of wade into as well. It's a a good chunky historical brief that covers all points. What's your favourite historical period? Do you have one then? Because I I flit around a lot, but I always keep dropping back to the Mediterranean to sort of um, Greeks. I am a butterfly. Um, I will flit and you know float from one to the next never really settling mm -hmm. um at the minute I'm, all my terrain is kind of generically medieval fantasy so mostly playing fantasy at the moment um but if i had to pick one i'd go cowboys mm. oh, I love everyone, loves a, good, everyone loves a good shootout yeah right definitely. <laughs> we had a great game in the office a few years back with uh, henry hyde um just oh, came wow. down yeah. We played a game of, of Cowboys and that counted as work. And that was <laughs> one, one of the best work days I think I'll ever have. But. Brilliant. I, I feel your yeah. pain. <laughs> yeah. uh, so then inheriting or helping to craft Osprey Games side of, of Osprey Publications, um, as an editorial director, what is the, the sort of the, the key components of your job then? Uh, so I oversee the, the Osprey Games operation as a whole, really. And that includes the war games, the board games, the role-playing games. Um, I also commission some of the uh, war games and uh, the role-playing games at the moment. And I kind of manage the editorial side of things on that score as well. Uh, really, it's just kind of overseeing the business and making sure the, the team I've got have what they need to keep doing good games, keep putting out great stuff so it's a nice job really it's mm. <laughs> uh i get to sit back and, and enjoy a lot uh not as much as i might like but a fair <laughs> bit it's always good to see what comes in you know new artwork new proposals it's that kind of joy of a surprise in your inbox on a monday morning mm. hasn't really gone away um mm -hmm. which is nice do you get the chance i suppose to look into things like the the rule development and the the illustrations and, and the like as they're coming through um, and sort of pick the people who are going to be working on certain projects or are you a sort of a step removed from that? Um, so most of the team kind of has their, their, their niches. So the board game team kind of divide the work up between them. I have a colleague on the wargaming side who maintains his list. 
mm. and uh, I kind of stick to mine. But yeah, we, we kind of hand uh, workloads out according to interests and preferences as much as possible, but also just workload and time. Mm. Um, for my money, art refs, I can, I can sink into those for hours. Uh, I mean, I can't, but I would <laughs> give it a chance. Um, I love doing art refs and kind of going to the Osprey archive, pulling books for, you know, reference material. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I could lose days to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the perks of, you know, kind of being, being in charge. Sometimes I get to say, I'm going to go ahead and do this. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, as far as game development goes, it all depends on the project. Um, some come into us pretty much just done. Um, some don't need a huge amount of work. Others need a bit more oversight and a bit more kind of stress testing before mm -hmm. before we we put anything out. But it really mm -hmm. does it really does depend. Do you get do you get to do quite a lot of playtesting and stuff then on the different projects and sort of sitting down with a whole bunch of models that you sort of dig out of your collection and sort of scatter onto the table and be like, right, let's try this out. <laughs> it, it again, it depends yeah. on the project. So I was um, I was testing uh, some new board game ideas recently. Um, mm -hmm. We had three people in; they needed a fourth, so I kind of uh, got drafted into that, <laughs> tested those, see how they were working, gave a bit of feedback. Uh, yeah, it really depends on the project. And yeah, you know, whether it's a core book or a supplement, you know, the amount of stress testing, like I say, will will vary. Well, speaking of core books and supplements, then the silver bayonet. Um, yeah, I could have sworn when I talked to Joe initially about the silver bayonet <laughs> that it was the plan was that it was just going to be a one off, a one and done. Yeah, uh, and since that point, um, it has expanded somewhat, and we know that there's books coming left, right, and center. Uh, so. With the decision to take it forward and to make it sort of more like Frostgrave with a comprehensive set of supplements with it that people can just pick and choose between, um, was that something that was posited by yourselves or did Joe come and go, well, I've got an idea for something else or, or how, does, how does it develop from here's my rule book, this is all you ever need to, oh, we can do multiple continents and um, geographic areas and, and stories and solos and all of these different supplements how do, how do they spring forth uh truth be told and i was checking my emails before before we we started speaking i can't remember i honestly can't remember whose bright idea it was to to do supplements <laughs> um so in the absence of facts i'm going to claim it was mine good um, yeah it makes sense yeah but yeah. no um joe <laughs> So Joe wrote the Silver Bayonet while he was working for us as an in-house game designer. It was part of part of his job, that first rule book. And then uh, he left towards the back end of 2020, I think, start yeah. of 2021, and went completely freelance. And it was around that time that we thought, yeah, Silver Bayonet's pretty good. Mm. And we just started chatting again. And, you know, somehow we came up with the idea of supplements. And um, Joe, I think, knew from the outset he didn't want to write all of them, and nor, nor did he really need to, um, because it went down really well. People seemed to get enthused by it. And um, one of the things, and there's a little scoop for you, um, we've, got, we've just signed a new supplement um, coming in the future for Italy. Um, it's mm -hmm. called The Shades of Calabria. And the author of that is a chap called T.C. Stephen, who we found on the um, social media, on, oh, wow. on the official Silver Bayonet <laughs> Facebook group. Okay. Um, he'd just been doing some homebrew stuff. That's that awesome. was really exciting, really interesting, and mm -hmm. had that great balance of adding something new mm -hmm. without going too overpowered or overblown. Mm -hmm. um and yeah we dropped him a line and started chatting and uh like i say we signed that um officially just last week so yeah i'm um, really excited that one's coming um it's kind of set in rural calabria kingdom of the two sicilies i think or no kingdom of naples sorry um and the, the shenanigans down there it's going to be quite far out if it's if it's only just been signed, then it is quite far out. Uh, it's mm. not actually as far off as our normal schedule. Normally, we're you know a couple of years ahead. This one's coming a mite sooner, but yeah, it is mm. still a good distance. 
I assume one of the well, one of the great things about the silver bayonet and probably why it's gone down so well is that it's essentially covering a period where you're effectively having a world at war. There's wars all over the place. There's armies fighting. There's units everywhere. There's you know soldiers getting lost in strange situations and all that kind of thing. But then it also ties into all of this folklore from the period as well. And so obviously you've got all of that European folklore that everything's been drawn on for Carpathians and the core book and everything, and then all this sort of North American stuff as well. And now, and now going into something like Italy as well, I think it sounds fascinating, especially as is it's probably going to sort of pull out sort of strange and weird things that probably people haven't heard about perhaps, I guess. So, yeah. So that's kind of the, yeah, we kind yeah. of aim to do that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so with, uh, with Carpathians and I'm going to attempt some names and mangle them. <laughs> We've got the Kappa Chun. Ka uh, the yeah. Dog fierce. The dog face, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, Muma Paduri. Um, yeah. And with the, I'm not even going to attempt to mangle these names. With the Canadian supplement, we've got some um, some traditional folkloric uh, entities that are nothing like anything really yeah. in in European folklore. They've got, that's the <laughs> one. Um, yeah, that's the one, the name I'm never going to try and yeah. pronounce. But they are terrifying concepts. So yeah, it's it's like you say. There's a lot of familiarity, which is steady ground, but mm -hmm. there's also a lot of novelty. Makes it sound a bit dismissive, but it is. It's new. It's something a little surprising, I think. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, that's the the line we can continue to walk for the the regional supplements going forward. It's one of these things where historic gamers. I know some historic gamers who obviously will dismiss it out of hand because it has weird fantasy in it but i know some who have jumped on going oh, i love this but it's the fantasy players the the non-historical gamers who have really seem to have taken to it because it it gives them access to historical gaming but at the same time there's the license to not worry about everything being 100 percent set you don't have to worry about the composition of a peninsula war british force you just want to go here's a british rifleman because mm -hmm. I've seen Sharp, and he's yeah. going to shoot a. That's me. <laughs> he's going to shoot a Revenant in the face, and it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's really opened. It it opens the door. It's the sort of the first um, first step for a lot of people towards historical gaming, um, and it's it's essentially given them permission to play around in the period without oh, having the, the pressure um, of how they should be playing. Now that's that's. I mean, like I said earlier, that's how I got into historical gaming. Mm. through fantasy and i don't know if it wasn't for warhammer ancient battles whether i would be playing historical games probably by this point i'd hope but uh <laughs> so yeah anything we can do to to get more people playing more games is a good thing as far as i'm concerned no matter the genre no matter the era so the uh the next book coming out is canada and it's been written by uh ash barker yeah. who who grabbed him because uh, i know obviously Joe and, and uh, Ash have collaborated in the past on various projects, including Blaster. Was that Blaster, uh, heck, yeah. Yeah. Was, was that Ash coming to you with an idea then that sort of started the ball rolling? Or no, that one was um, that one was me. I think going to Ash on the grounds that hey, he's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, true. <laughs> I, I honestly think it started off being that simple. Yeah. Uh, but no, Ash should you know, like you say, he he and Joe collaborate a fair bit on uh, on things like Blaster in the past, and he's written you know some great stuff for us as well in Last Days and um, Gamma Wolves. Gamma Wolves. You know, we like Ash. We like working with Ash. And you know, when the Canadian supplement is is mooted, uh, Joe and I were throwing around ideas for potential theaters, potential supplements, and uh, Canada and War of eighteen twelve um, was was kind of dropped out there. I can't think of anyone I would have gone to before Ash. He was, mm -hmm. you know, I was just laser beam. Oh yeah, Ash. He's he gets gaming. He gets this scale of gaming. He's been really supportive of Silver Bayonet, and he's Canadian. So if anyone is well placed to do that justice, <laughs> um, so yeah, and, you know, I dropped him a line. He said uh, absolutely, and um, here we are. And he's done a fantastic job with it. He's a, a sensitive approach as well, because obviously, you know the the treatment of the First Nations people mm. is a big issue in, in Canada. Um, mm. And he's approached it with care and delicacy and has taken advice from uh, members of the respective communities. And 
I think it's come out really well. It, it shows a lot of knowledge, but a lot of care as well. Yeah. I really like the, uh, the setup for it. It, it, see, it follows the Carpathian um, supplements sort of layout. So uh, you have your bit of background about the area, uh, the beastry, that sort of thing. But then there's a five scenario adventure and then a, a solo slash cooperative mini campaign as well. Um, is that the the sort of the format that the little expansive supplements are going to be taken when they're, they're done in? Will, will the Italian uh, Caballeri sort of uh, follow the same sort of layout or do you approach them very much on a case by case basis, depending on what you what you're being sort of handed? A little bit of both, probably. I mean, in the in the broad strokes, yeah, they'll follow a similar format um, in the same way that the Frostgrave and Stargrave books do. Um, they add a little bit of everything for players, mm -hmm. um, some new troop types, some new recruitment um, options, some new monsters, and yeah, new games, new scenarios to, to play through. But the exact makeup is, is um, always open to discussion. Don't like to pigeonhole things too much if we can help it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather have the best supplement rather than one that you know fits certain conditions or preconceived notions. Oh, and sort of okay, a little, a little extra spoiler. But one of the things I'm discussing uh, with TC Stephen for the Italy book mm -hmm. is the idea of adding a what we're currently calling a hard mode, something okay. that just gives you an immediate way of increasing the difficulty. Nice. Um, I don't know if it'll make the final book. Don't know if it'll be like a an online release or something. I don't know if it'll mm -hmm. just get dropped after testing, but things like that. So kind of, we don't ever really want to do supplements that are compulsory, um, that yeah. you know, change the, the nature of the game fundamentally. Mm. Um, and that you have to buy to keep enjoying the game, but little things like that, that change the game state or give you a completely different way of approaching it. Um, those things I love. Um, because you can always flavor to taste. And that for me, at least is what I, what I like in a game. Um, the ability to kind of pick and choose what works for me and my, my group. One of the things that, that I really enjoy is, is throwing the extra little, um, speed bumps in my own path. Uh, so during this week, myself and Shay have been playing the solo, uh, campaign cooperatively from Carpathians. Um, we decided to do it. There's a hard mode in there where, uh, injuries are never fully healed between games yeah. uh, and that has caused us no end of uh, distress as we've been playing through but if people want to know more about that they can go back and watch the games <laughs> as far as the the miniature side goes then we've had uh, fairly comprehensive releases for silver bayonet and carpathian's got a, a whole wave of monsters to itself um is that going to be similar with the upcoming Canada and Egypt and Italy down the line? Or uh, when you're working with North Stars, it's sort of, uh, we are doing this. Do you, do you fancy doing something or we need these? And then if you can do anything extra, that would be great. You know, how, does, how does that partnership work? So on the Silver Bayonet, uh, we don't really tell North Star what to do at all. Um, we make sure they've got the... Um, They've got the manuscript, they've got the artwork, and you know, we speak with, with Nick at North Star mm -hmm. most weeks um, on various things. And you know, if he's got an idea for something or if something's caught his interest, he'll throw it out to us and say, you know, what do you reckon to this? And we'll reciprocate in kind. You know, we might say, this is the, the new unit list coming. It would be really cool if. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, the, the nature of the, the relationship we have is that um, they're kind of independent to work on mm. on what they think will do well and um, while we're in constant communication we don't tend to weigh in too heavily on, on that regard um, so yeah hopefully there's more to come um, but I would say that's probably for Nick uh, yeah. and North Star to decide at the moment so uh, <laughs> I, I imagine certainly it's for them to to reveal news about so <laughs> I, I must reach out to nick and see if he'll reveal any news to us <laughs> sometimes he does sometimes he says how did you get this number 
Please stop calling. <laughs> Hang on, that, that does sound like. Uh, it sounds like an awful lot of fun. So we've we've sort of swung around towards the end. Um, we know where we're going uh, off to Egypt, and then sometime in the future, Italy as well. Do you have any specific areas that you you know you definitely want to come back to, or at the moment is it just sort of feeling out and seeing where? Um, people are interested in exploring regions? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I would love to to revisit Egypt probably in due course. I think there's huge amounts of stuff you can you can mine in that region. And I'd love to do the more mainstream um, topics as well. I'd love to do the peninsula. Mm. Um, I'd love to do you know the the march on uh, on Russia. Um, oh. There's so many, there's so many vibrant and entertaining parts of the war, as you were saying earlier. You know, you've got everyone involved. It's it's nationwide. It's worldwide. Sorry, mm. um, I'd like to do India. Um, I was going to say India would be amazing to explore, especially with their rich history and folklore and, and yeah. that kind of thing. That would be fantastic. Yeah, it's it's just a matter of finding uh, authors. Mm. So. Um, yeah, we always welcome proposals. But, um, <laughs> those those doors are always open, um, and yeah, finding people that can do it, um, yeah. do it justice, really. Uh, Sounds like a a fantastic incentive for people to go and join the Facebook group oh, and yeah, start yeah. posting. Go in there. There we go. Follow, if, follow the stories of Sharp. Find out where he went, and then build oh, a campaign based it, around that or something. And he, then he was go. in India first, and then. <laughs> There we go, yeah. Uh, and then came over. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've, I would love to see more um, uh, exploring beyond the, the regions of Europe. I, I'm really excited to see where Canada goes. Uh, maybe we'll get some stuff in South America. There were some interesting wars around the 1810, 1830s there. I mean, that's, and, that's an itch that I would love to scratch. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, Sharp's Devil as well was always my favorite of the books. The yes. one where after the, after the wars where he goes off to, I think, Chile. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the Napoleonic Wars. Obviously, the harvestmen appear during the Napoleonic Wars, but there's always room yeah. for aggressive expansion slightly beyond that. Um, uh, we'll so, see on that, Scott. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us today, Phil. No, not at all. It's been lovely. Mm. Uh, there we go, folks. If you've any questions, please feel free to drop them below and we'll fire them across to Phil and the guys at Osprey. Uh, let us know what you think about the plans for the Silver Bayonet long term and if there's any places you would like to explore or maybe you've got an idea for some sort of weird or wacky folk tale that really should be explored. Uh, let us know that below as well. Till next time, bye bye. This week, you could win one of three bundles for the Silver Bayonet. Winners will be chosen from OnTabletop.com, YouTube, and the Cop of Games members. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.